Hi friends. What's on my mind today? I was reading comments uh, uh, from my last video and I uh, thought I would answer a few of them. But several of the comments uh, were appreciating my uh, telling how I use the magnets to keep the wind from blowing the cover off of my BMW. And since uh, people seem to be appreciative of that tip, I thought I'd show you another way that I use uh, the magnets. Let me show you. Please enjoy my stories or whatever else might be on my mind today. It's not a sunny day today here on the north shore of Lake Chapala in Ajijic, Jalisco, Mexico. But when it is, the sun shines up there in the morning and comes right down here and blinds the side of my head while I'm on my computer. So I use these magnets to shield the sun with a curtain. And I guess we could just have a curtain here, but this is what I do. And I use those magnets to do that. And later in the day, if I want the sunshine to come in, it's just real easy to adjust the curtain. That's what I use those magnets for. The magnets I'm talking about are these. They're called neodymium. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It's uh, N-E-O-D-Y-M-I-U-M. And you can find those uh, somewhere. I think there's a link down below on my Amazon page. Um, they cost about a dollar a piece and you can buy six or ten or a dozen of them. And all of the uses I've found for them, I'm just really sold on those things. Uh, if you want to use my Amazon link, that's great. If not, I'm probably not going to make that 18 cents if you buy a dozen of those. <laughs> I had a plan for today's video. All week, I kept a piece of paper and a pencil on my dining room table, and I made notes about all of the random thoughts I had all week. And I sat down today to read my random thoughts and I came up with a life lesson. The lesson that I learned is that all of the things that I thought were important a week ago aren't important anymore. <laughs> the news cycle has moved on. And uh, I think that is a life lesson, that you shouldn't get too excited about things, whether it's politics or terrible things going on in the world or even happy thoughts. A week from now, probably won't be important. Time to move on. So anyway, I'm not going to read you and develop all of the random thoughts that I've had during the week because, as I said, most of them just don't seem important today. Uh, I did circle a couple of them. Uh, people have been giving me a bad time about using too much bleach to wash my vegetables. And uh, I agree. If you watch my video about washing vegetables with bleach, or washing all of the things that I order from Walmart with bleach, I use way too much bleach. Uh, but let me back up about 18, 19 years and tell you why I do that. Uh, I don't actually use that much bleach all the time, but we do wash our vegetables here in Mexico with bleach water. Uh, I don't use that much bleach in that spray bottle I'm using to wash off those things. Um, it's way too much bleach. If you can smell it that strongly and it's slimy on your hands when you're doing it. We use a dishpan full of water and a few squirts out of that bottle into the whole dishpan full of water. And we've always washed our vegetables that way because here in Mexico, um, they still use DDT and other even worse carcinogenic compounds on their agricultural fields to control insects. And, you need to wash that stuff off before you eat your vegetables here in Mexico. 
the ant powder that you see me uh, spraying, uh, uh, not spraying, but powdering the fire ants with, and uh, the leaf cutter ant nest, that's a very strong carcinogenic chemical sold here for agricultural use. I buy it in a 30 kilo sack at an agricultural supply store in Hokotepec. And uh, it's a chemical that's banned in 50 countries, including the United States. So anyway, wash your veggies. The other reason that we wash our vegetables here with bleach, or there's a commercial product you can call it, uh, buy, I think it's called Microdyne or something like that. People wash their vegetables with that because um, there are other things here that are just as bad and just as dangerous as uh, industrial chemicals, agricultural chemicals on the vegetables, and that is uh, amoebas. Um, you don't want to ingest amoebas. If you want to know more about it, Google it. Um, Anyway, that's what I wanted to say about uh, the comments about using too strong a bleach in watching, washing my vegetables. We have long before the coronavirus washed our vegetables here in Mexico for very different reasons. And um, even after the virus is gone, we will continue to do so. Uh, another one I uh, circled here in all of my two pages of random thoughts is about the post office. And um, I don't want to make a political statement about the post office. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican or what you think about this problems with the post office and the postmaster general being grilled in Congress about the problems. He claims that he's doing those things for um, a cost reduction uh, purposes in reducing the uh, number of machines at post office and cutting um, overtime hours and that it's a cost-effective thing and uh, just a couple of thoughts. Number one, the post office is not a business. The post office is a public service. Um, creating the federal highway system in the United States was not cost effective. It was something that we paid for. The roads in your local town are not something that are cost effective. They're something that the government pays for with your tax dollars. Um, the military is not something that's cost effective. It's something that we pay for as a service for our uh, country with tax dollars. The post office is not a business, it's a public service, and yes, it costs money. Now, I got no problem with making it more cost effective, but here's my one random thought for the day. I have a friend up in uh, Indiana, and she sells things on the internet. Um, it's not... It, it's not cupcakes, but it's a perishable product like that, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. But she mails things out and she uses that part of the postal service that guarantees delivery in a certain amount of time. She told me two things have been happening since July. One is that the post office guarantees that delivery and if it's not on time, she gets her postage back. And it's like three, four, five dollars per shipment and she's fairly successful at this. She does a lot of shipments every day. Since the beginning of July, she has been making hundreds of dollars per day in refunded postage. Now, her customers are paying for the postage, so she's getting paid. She pays the post office. The post office, because it's not getting delivered on time, is giving her the money back. Hundreds of dollars per day. She's one small business. The backbone of the economy in the United States is small businesses. More and more, more of them are online. 
So the postmaster general thinks he's saving money by letting the mail be late? Just one thing that flies in the face of that being a cost-cutting measure. <coughs> Enough about that. And like I said, it's not a political statement. I think that's a business statement. Uh, as I said, these are random thoughts, so there's no uh, connection between each of these random thoughts. And this one is about uh, one of my experiences with the police. A couple of videos ago, I was talking about my experience with the uh, motorcycle cop here in Chapala, and when he was directing traffic, getting the... Um, Getting, getting him to be distracted by me having my passenger fake throwing up in a bag as the policeman came to the window and said we were going to the doctor. Anyway, that's another story. You can go back to my video about uh, touring Chapala if you want to see that. Another life lesson about not getting too excited, I guess. I was at a uh, Fred Meyer store in Hillsboro, Oregon with my little black Suzuki sidekick that's the tow car for my motorhome uh, visiting our daughter in Oregon and as I got out of the car I very consciously saw that I'm parked right next to the cart return so I've mentally decided I could return to my car and I go into the store, get my bags, and I come out of the same door, and uh, it's not there. The space by the cart return is, there's no car there. Somebody's stolen my car. So I call the police and report it stolen, and, you know, name, address, license plate number that I have memorized, and everything description of the car and I call my daughter and she and my wife Lynn are on their way to pick me up. And I can't believe this is happening that somebody has stolen my it's really an old car not worth stealing why would somebody steal it although um, those uh, Suzuki sidekicks with a, a hard top are uh, quite desirable as a tow car but anyway I decide to walk down towards the entrance to the parking lot where my daughter and Lynn will be coming to pick me up. And as I'm walking down past the front of the store, I realize there's another front door. <laughs> and yes, I've come out of the other door and my car is right where I left it by the other cart return. So I'm walking out there elated that my car is not actually stolen, and as I'm standing there feeling really good about the car being not stolen, not about myself, uh, my daughter drives up with my wife with the passenger side window rolled down. She looks at me and my car and says, how old are you, Jerry? Now I have to call the police back and report that uh, I found my car and because I don't want to drive on down the street and have a cop stop me and have to have me explain why I'm driving a stolen vehicle. Uh, the cop, much to uh, the cops, 911, a dispatcher actually, and she is extremely gracious about this and says, it's okay, sir, you would not believe how many times this happens that people can't find their car in the parking lot and report it stolen, only to call us back in a few minutes that they have found it. So, anyway, uh, how old are you, Jerry? Don't get excited. Things are probably going to be different in a little while. Uh, that reminds me of another one that I wrote down here right below that called The Episode at the First Interstate Bank. 
This was back when I was in business, and uh, I had a relatively new contract with another business down in Oakland, California. And I'd opened up a business account at the First Interstate Bank. Um, the business was a sales business and I was contracting with another business to buy the sales leads and uh, we were getting commission checks of about $15,000 a week. Well, because it was a new business and I was from Oregon, I didn't yet have a California DBA when we signed the contract. So the business that's writing the $15,000 a check, a check a, a, every week to my business is doing it to my personal name, Jerry. So we're getting a $15,000 check every week to made out to Jerry, my last name. And, um, I had a manager who's running my office down there, and I'm flying down from Portland a couple times a week and, you know, taking care of things, but he's making the bank deposits across the street at the First Interstate Bank, and we have a stamp from the bank that says, for deposit only, it's a regular business kind of thing, you stamp the back of the check for deposit only, and it's deposited into the account. Well. One day he forgets to stamp it and he goes over there um, and just signs my name on the back of the check and hands it to the teller. So this goes on for several weeks, actually maybe a month and a half. And uh, I'm down there in Oakland and the commission check is laying on his desk and I pick it up and say, hey, I'm going to lunch, I'll, I'll deposit the check. So I go over there and I walk up to the teller and I turn the check over and I sign it right in front of her with my name, because it's my name on the front of the check. And she says, just a minute, and goes somewhere and pretty soon the manager comes out and he says, would you step into my office please? So I do, I step into his office and he asks me to sit down, and he leaves and shuts the door. And I'm sitting in there for about 10 minutes, and thinking, what the heck's going on? And finally, the manager comes back, and he has a policeman with him. And they want to know uh, why I have tried to <laughs> forge a check, or sign a check that's not mine, because the teller, she knows Jerry, because Jerry's been in there every week signing the check in front of her, and she knows Jerry. And this, and I'm not Jerry. Jerry is Rick, the guy, my manager, who's been signing the check with my name. Well, it doesn't take very long for us to figure out what's going on, and I have enough identification to prove that I am, in fact, Jerry, who has opened up the account at the First National Bank uh, under the business name so-and-so. Uh, so that gets all straightened out and uh, the officer leaves and the bank manager is apologetic, although not extremely apologetic because the problem was that my manager was doing something that he shouldn't have been doing. Uh, at the end of the conversation is that I tell the bank manager if anybody comes in here and wants to deposit $15,000 in my account, please just take the money and ask questions later. Uh, First Interstate Bank, Oakland, California. Uh, nearly arrested for signing my own name on the back of my own check. Well, enough old stories. Let's uh, talk about a couple of uh, comments and questions that I'd like to talk about. Uh, loved your videos. Always enjoy the drives. Uh, hope they got the water leak fixed. No, they didn't get the water leak fixed. And I got a comment from another uh, person who lives up in Argos Calientes who said that uh, he's had a water leak that's gone on for years and nobody's fixed it, so 
I may just have to go out there and shut the water off out in the middle of the street and fix it myself. Uh, it's not a big problem for me. It's not going on my water bill or anything, but the weeds in front of my carport sure are loving it. Uh, I enjoy making a big garden. Did you ever grow veggies? Yeah. Uh, when we were first down here, because there are essentially three growing seasons per year, uh, we had big gardens. Lynn was quite the gardener. Even back up in Oregon, we always had gardens. Even when we lived in the city, we'd have big gardens. And one of the rental houses when we were younger, um, before we had kids and didn't have better things to do, <laughs> we, we had a rental house and we rototilled the whole backyard, rototilled all the grass under, and uh, planted a garden. Planted everything kind of vegetable we could come up with. Uh, the landlord wasn't too happy about it, but <laughs> we had a lot of vegetables. Anyway, yeah, we planted uh, uh, lots of vegetables down here. The one thing we could never um, make grow correctly was tomatoes because there's some organism in the soil that makes them all get misshapen. Uh, we were never successful at growing tomatoes. One time Lynn and I had a, a contest. Uh, she was going to grow them in the ground and I was going to grow them in a pot. And I went to Home Depot and bought a whole bunch of special miracle grow potting soil and tomato vitamins and whatever. And um, they still got that same ugly, misshapen, I don't know. Never have been successful at growing tomatoes. They do it here across the lake. There's huge, big tomato fields, but we never could. But all the other vegetables, uh, yeah, we used to have a lot of vegetable gardens. And then, um, uh, well, Lynn kind of got too down in the back to do gardening. So that kind of went by the wayside because it was her passion, not mine. And then for a while we paid Jesus, our handyman, to do the gardening, and we split the vegetables with him and let him use our gardens. Uh, they're just weeds now. We don't garden anymore. Uh, basically because uh, Lynn wasn't able to continue gardening. Um, Jesus is no longer with us, and I figured out that um, they sell each and every one of those vegetables every day at Walmart. <laughs> so yeah, did we ever grow vegetables? Yeah, we used to grow a lot of them. You're amazing, you're living a dream. You know, we really are. Uh, what's your favorite Mexican food? Carne and suugo. Carne and suugo, the literal translation being meat in its juices. It's uh, essentially soup. It's bean, beef, and bacon soup. And then it's garnished with fresh chopped cilantro and um, uh, chopped onions. It's um, a dish that is my favorite dish, and I've even learned how to cook it at home and do it so quite often. I even make it when we're traveling in the motorhome. Uh, I'll tell you the story about how we first got uh, introduced to Carney and Sumugo. Many years ago, we used to travel back and forth from the United States in our old Southwind motorhome. And one time, we were uh, heading north, and uh, there's a book called um, Camping in Mexico by the churches. Anyway, there was a campground listed in there by um, Topeak, a town between here and Mazatlan. And we went to this uh, campground that was listed, but it was closed. So we went to the nearest Walmart and we're standing in the front of the Walmart 
uh, going to go in and see if it was okay if we stayed there in the parking lot overnight. And the guy there by the uh, cab stand came over and started talking to us in English, and his name was Julio. And uh, Julio offered to go in with us and talk to the manager um, in Spanish and see if it was okay for us to stay in the parking lot. He assured us it probably was, but it would be okay to let the manager know that we were going to do that. So uh, we went in, and uh, one of the things I remember about that particular moment is that uh, he talked to a person, and then on the loudspeaker, they called for the manager to come. And it was all in Spanish, but I understood that they were asking for the PIC to appear. The PIC being the, the person in charge, but PIC was in English. <laughs> so anyway, the PIC came and Julio explained it and was a problem. And uh, we went and did a bunch of grocery shopping and as we came out and we were just unloading groceries into the motorhome, uh, Julio came along in his beat-up old pickup and asked us if we would like to go to dinner. Well, um, we didn't know Julio. We, you know, we're a little hesitant. We're in a town we weren't familiar with, in a country that we didn't yet belong in. It was our first trip uh, down and going back. And uh, we kind of talked it over with each other and decided, hey, you got to put yourself out there if you're going to have an experience. So anyway, we agreed to go to dinner with Julio and his beat up old pickup. And uh, as we arrived at Julio's home there in Topeka, uh, things started to change for the better. First of all, it was a very nice home. and. Um, we went in and met his family, and one of them was a red-haired kid in his um, late teens, early 20s, who spoke perfect English. And it turns out that Julio had lived in the United States for many years, and then uh, his U.S. Uh, wife, and he divorced, um, who was the mother of, and she was a, a U.S. citizen, U.S. person. Um, uh, not a Mexican, and uh, the mother of this red-haired 20-year-old um, son of Julio's. But he also had a very young Mexican wife and some younger children, um, a baby and uh, maybe a three-year-old. So Julio had spent a life in um, the United States and then come back and married a younger Mexican wife and um, having a new family. Anyway, we all went to dinner, and it was the first time that we had had carne in Sumugo. Uh, Julio became a friend, and um, uh, all of our trips coming and going, we would stop and uh, spend time with Julio and his family, and there's a lot of other stories about that. One of them is, um, um, you know, I'll see if I can put a link up here to the one of about the me and the pistoleros. <laughs> the pistoleros were Julio and his um, brothers. Anyway, I'll put a link up here to that video if I can find it. It's one from a long time ago. And um, I'll let the I'll let that tell you the rest of the story about Jerry and the pistoleros. And another comment. Jerry, please stop telling people to come here. You are not going to like it when Ahihik is at two million people. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to be long gone when Ahihik is two million people, but this comes up quite often that um, local people and uh, local friends, um, and this isn't a friend, but it's a person who obviously lives here because he says here, 
and is concerned about the growing population here along the north shore of Lake Chapala. Uh, it is growing, and I can tell you, uh, since I came here in 2001, that um, I too am not real happy all the time about the increased population, the growth in traffic, um, the longer wait for services, um, making reservations at restaurants that uh, used to not be crowded. Uh, I too am uh, sometimes not very happy about more and more people coming here to the wonderful um, paradise that we live in. But I don't want to take all the credit for that. Uh, in spite of friends, uh, friend, in a friendly way, telling me, hey, stop talking about this place. There's too many people here already. Um, it is said in uh, jest, but it's, there's a grain of truth to that. I, like I said, I'm not taking all responsibility, but certainly me talking about it with 30-some thousand subscribers um, may have had a small impact on how many people are coming here to check it out. Um, I'm not going to say that I want to discourage you from doing that. It is a wonderful place and I like talking about it in a very positive way, not only here on the north shore of Lake Chapala, but talking about Mexico in general in a positive way. It's one of the reasons that I um, have the channel and continue the channel is to give a different voice to the often negative things presented in the media about Mexico. I had another comment here about, uh, oh yeah, they're saying Mexico is terrible, terrible in the uh, COVID crisis. Well, it's terrible everywhere, but it's the worst in the United States. And so far, uh, Mexico is not as bad as it appears to be statistically in the United States. So, if you're hearing that uh, it's worse in Mexico, um, my experience and my reading of the news is that that's not actually the case. Anyway, what I started to say is I like uh, giving a different voice to all of the bad things that you hear about Mexico because with 20 years of experience living in Mexico as an expat, um, I think I have an opinion that um, has some validity about whether things are terrible in Mexico or not. But, as I started to say, I don't want to take all the credit for there being more and more people here. There are a couple of uh, factors. Um, the economies in the United States and Canada have a great deal to do with how uh, hot the real estate market is here. And d don't ask me questions about the real estate here. I'm not a realtor and I'm not a rental agent. I'm just a guy who lives here and who has rented things here and has uh, bought things here in the real estate market, but I'm not a realtor or a rental agent. Um, the economies of the uh, United States and Canada have a great deal to, to do with how good the real estate market is here in terms of it being a buyer's market or a seller's market. and. Um, uh, that's one of the things that controls whether or not a flood of people are coming or it slows down. And right now it has slowed down because of the um, problems with the virus and travel and tourism. Uh, the other thing that drives the market here and the reason that it's busier and busier and more and more people here is that we are 35 miles south of the second largest city in Mexico and uh, Mexicans have uh, the money to come and participate in the real estate market here. And it's a wonderful place to come down out of the city for the weekend. Think uh, years ago San Francisco and Carmel. Think any place that used to be a small town uh, that's uh, driving distance from a large city. Lincoln City, Oregon, and Portland. 
we used to go down to Lincoln City and think we could buy something for five, six thousand dollars that now costs a half a million dollars. And I'm not talking about it's a half a million dollars better, it's the same piece of crap two bedroom house on the beach. Anyway, we are next door to a very large um, citizenry in Guadalajara and many of them have the money to have a weekend retreat. My house was a weekend retreat for uh, a Guadalajara family um, before I bought it. And there are many homes here that um, come and go in the real estate market that are not uh, prices driven or congestion is not entirely driven by the expat population. It is, in a lot of cases, driven by the fact that we are the weekend destination for a city of between five and six million. Uh, anyway, like I said, <laughs> I'm not going to stop talking about how wonderful it is here, but I ain't taking all of the credit for the number of people who are coming. Uh, that's what I got for you today. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up. And please subscribe and hit that little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed what was on my mind today.